Welcome everybody to another Thelby Friday. Jess Thelby, Vitality Roses head coach. Is that what we're calling this? Thelby Fridays. Apparently so, yeah. It's stuck, hasn't it, on a Friday. So we'll run with that for as long as people are finding it interesting. Well, it's great to be back. I'm Claire Carter from the BBC. And today we are talking about leadership. And I think who better, Jess, to have alongside you to talk leadership but Colonel Andrea Zanke, who is Chair of Army Netball, and Sergeant Nordia Masters, who is Captain of Army Netball. Welcome, both of you ladies. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you very much. So where are you? I mean, Andrea, where are you at the moment? Um, I'm in my study at home. So in down in Stockbridge, just below Andover. I normally work in Andover. Um, but yeah, trying to avoid the, uh, the heat wave at the moment. I know. Yeah. Um, what about yourself, Nordia? I am at home. I live in Portsmouth. So I just rushed in from work and then came in. I'm in my living room. Yes, <laughs> so, sunny Portis head shining your way. Yeah, no, it, is, it is a beautiful day. But even I'm going to say it's, um, I haven't seen much of it. It's a bit too hot. <laughs> That's such a bad thing to say, isn't it? I'm pretty sure we do rain for about another week after this. So I need to uh, make the most of it, but no, it's good, good to be back and it's really lovely to welcome both of you on. I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to hearing some of the, um, the army stories and experiences and looking forward to learning. The CVs are so impressive, not just from an army perspective, but it's the netball as well. Indeed. And, and I mean, that's where we're going to start. I know that we'll sort of focus quite a lot on leadership, actually, and, and the roles that you play within the army, how you take that to the core, if you can transfer those things. But I mean, Andrea, first of all, as, as chair of Army Netball, what does that involve for you? Um, so, I mean, I've been involved in Army Netball for 27 years, um, was the secretary uh, as a young captain, um, and, and I've now sort of moved into the chair role. Um, the chair role is sort of as much or as little as you want to do, but having been involved for so long and having been a player and playing masters up until two years ago, um, I know all the girls, I know most of their commanding officers and the people they work for. And so it's, there's, there's the, the tactical element of getting the girls released, getting them, making sure that they can get to training, get to be on court. But it's also, you know, having a look at the strategy, having a look at how we want to progress it, take it forward. And as I say, it's changed a lot since running it out of the ops room of my regiment as a captain, you know, in a, in a regimental minibus going to the inter-counties championships up in Middlesbrough. Changed from, from that to actually a really professional um, outfit now. And, you know, seeing what we can do for the players and how we can push them. Um, and to say that we've now got um, four internationals um, compared to back in the day when I was playing, and we definitely didn't have any of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of internationals, I mean, Nordia, coming from Jamaica, I love the fact that, that on your CV, pl plucked out by none other than Norma Plummer, <laughs> who I think people may have heard of. <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah, that was um that was amazing going over on assignment and being able to go and play netball in Northern Ireland and she just picked me out. Yeah, that was good. And then it just started there. And that included what well, was a Commonwealth Games, wasn't it? Giving it Northern did, Ireland yeah. your best ever result. Yes, in twenty fourteen, yes. Up um up in Glasgow. Really good experience. So in terms of your netball now, I mean I know things were on hold as they are for everybody, but again it's yeah. Captain, I mean, over the last sort of season, couple of seasons, how things been? Um, things have been improving. Things have been on a steady rise. We have, um, we've got UK Armed Forces where half the, well, more than half the team is Army players. And we went and won Netball Europe um, last year. So things have been going on really well for us. Um, in terms of training, nobody's really training at the moment as a team, but we're doing it as individuals. So I would do um, practices and send to the girls via WhatsApp and they would then um, recreate and do those practices. And then we'll advance it when people are comfortable with them. So we do a lot of stuff um, over the internet at the moment. Yeah. Well, that's we've good. just started a, um, we just Zoom. started a Zoom training session, which uh, yeah. I went to last week and, and it did kill me for two days. 
<laughs> That's good. There'll probably be people everywhere relieved that they're not the only ones. Now, Jess, we're going to talk leadership today. And I know we kind of looked at the role of, of coaching in previous weeks. But being a leader can actually, when I say be anybody in the team, having those leadership qualities. I, for you, when did you know or when did you have that inkling that you were nearing towards you know being a strong leader in your team and, and eventually you know rising to where you are when did you know you had those capabilities as a leader uh I don't know if there's ever I don't know if there is a one moment where you kind of see yourself as a leader I think um I think a lot of it depends on your experiences growing up doesn't it both in terms of your home life your school life your sporting life and the type of environments and cultures and leaders that you most probably surrounded yourself with so I, I don't think there's a particular moment where I can say oh I really felt like I was a leader um, but I just think I was very fortunate that I was in environments and a family that were very kind of active and very much into sport and my mum is quite a shy and retiring type to be honest but she, even in those early days when I was a, a young primary school aged uh, pupil it was my mum that tried to start up a local netball club for other mums and that in itself is leadership and yet you wouldn't necessarily think that she has these um, traditional characteristics of, of what stereotypically we might think leader is um, mm -hmm. so I think there are moments where you can kind of look around whether it's family members or friends or sport in the sporting context where you kind of see great leadership and a, what I learned is a lot of it can be quite subtle it doesn't need to be noisy or loud it can be around just setting a direction and steering people towards that and showing, I, I think, I consider myself quite an, I'm, I'm most probably more of a nurturer and quite a collaborator. So I, I just thrive off working with other people. Um, so I, a lot of it for me is quite subtle uh, and just sh about showing compassion. And my, I guess my leadership in this particular role is just born out of the fact that I love to be part of a team. Um, I'm sure as with <clears throat> lots of people, I experience lots of different sports. Um, and I quickly knew that although I might have been competent at a number of sports, the ones that I definitely enjoyed the most were the ones that were team sports. So yeah. I went to some fantastic events in athletics and, um, and other kind of individual sports. It just didn't do anything for me at all. It just wasn't, it just, the, the absence of the team was, was, yeah, it, it just wasn't me. So I think trying to help people to be the best they can be and drive towards a common and agreed like goal and objective is the thing that I kind of get up and get excited about every day in particular obviously with the role that I have with the roses so yeah no no particular moment really and I you know I wasn't necessarily yes I did captain certain teams but I wasn't always the first one on the list as captain for a lot of teams and um, again that's most probably influenced how I look at leadership now when I'm working with teams because I do genuinely feel whilst it sounds a little bit um, <clears throat> a little bit corny that I do believe everyone can lead and there is a leader in everybody um, to a lesser or greater extent and very different styles of leadership and it's how you can get the best out of those people um, and I, I, I try to steer away from creating a culture or environment where people are really dependent on others um, yeah. so trying to create those independent thinkers but that ultimately they work brilliantly as a team and getting that team cohesion right so yeah lots of influences for me so yeah I'm still learning Claire. <laughs> well I mean Nordia you know being team captain you know the, the army netball's captain do you think that you sort of rose out of everybody else to get that role there was obviously something obvious about you to kind of say yeah all right I'll do it or is it like some of our other teams where it's just, I don't want a bit, no, I don't want a bit. All right, you'll do it. <laughs> um, well, I played army netball for a number of years first before I was even considered to be a captain. And to be honest with you, um, I knew it's something that I had in me, but I didn't expect to be a captain. And over the years, we changed coaches. And then we had Maggie Jackson. So she took over um, army netball. And that was the year she and Joe... Bain, Joe Van, who was Joe Bain, they selected me among with other people as captain. So <clears throat> it wasn't something that like people didn't want. They saw they saw what they saw in me and then made that decision. And um I accepted the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess if anybody knows anything, if anybody knows anything about leadership, it's a person. and you know again again for you, is there anything that you've taken, Andrea? from rising to the levels you have done within your career, but noticing any of that on a netball court? 
Yeah, I mean, it, my netball career and my army career have been absolutely hand in hand. And anyone who knows me in green knows that netball is my passion and it's not necessarily about me playing it, but like Jess, it's, it's you know, getting other people to play. Um, and so I think it's, it's that, say, the same as Jess, sort of nurturing and, uh, and encouraging, but some people might say a little bit coercing as well. <laughs> and so that, that ability to, um, you know, in the workplace to, to, to get your point across and to, to, you know, articulate what you're trying to say transfers really nicely into sort of getting your point across to the team and and what you're trying to get them to achieve you know with you but also you know because the army is quite demanding on the girls there's there's quite often um, a lot of the players have real conflicts of, of work versus versus netball and and again it's being able to listen to them and being able to advise them that actually you know Maybe this is the year that they take a year off, that they can always come back. Um, or, you know, you know their boss and you know that actually they have nothing that vital in the next year. And so this is a season for them to come and, and really, um, to really shine. So I think, it, I think it's probably that, that collaborative, that coercive, you know, power where you, you, can, you can influence, but hopefully in a positive manner. I think you explained that really well. It's almost just a form of manipulation, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> right there, which I love. I once heard a quote that said, attitude reflects leadership. Mm -hmm. Do you see that within the people that you lead, Jess? Attitude reflects leadership. Yeah, I think so, because I guess we're all quite fortunate that we work, although they feel like the very different kind of areas, everyone's made a conscious choice to either enter the army or to pursue a sporting career at this at the top level um, and so I, I think there's kind of a prerequisite there that tells you something about the character traits of the people that are involved in in either the army or within the netball context um, and I think yeah I think attitude does reflect leadership um, one of the things that I take quite a lot of joy out of is that even in this role in the short time that I've been in it but most probably in other roles where I've worked for a lot longer <clears throat> is recognizing the abilities and characteristics of of leadership in people sometimes before they've recognized it in themselves and playing a small part in trying to bring that out of people and amplify that i tell, take real joy out of that when when you can see people really stepping up you know like we've i've worked in so many netball environments now where you've got youngsters and i think most probably back when i was playing there was almost an unspoken hierarchy you know if you're the you're the deb debutant in a senior team you don't really have a voice or it's harder to have one and maybe that was more a reflection of me and how I carried myself but I definitely think there was that unspoken hierarchy in teams and I, do I don't think that's the case anymore and I think that's changed a lot um, yeah. and not just in the context of my role but I kind of have observed that in other netball teams as well and environments and I, I love that I love kind of giving handing out a bit more responsibility and nudging people whether you're 18 years old in, in your Super League team for the first time or you're entering the Roses you've got 100 caps you, you, I think leadership is for everybody um, so yeah I definitely think it reflects attitude and just almost not wanting people to, to stand still and almost abdicate responsibility if anything I try to create environments where I I hand out a bit more and a bit more and a bit more and just see what happens and be okay with that as well. Like it, there is no particular set agenda from my point of view. Um, I think it's just allowing others to explore it and become really comfortable in the skin that they're in, but also how they best contribute to the team overall. Um, so yeah, totally agree. Nordia, do you see that from your girls? Um, yes. I am. Most of the army girls, because everybody has got different um, ways of approach and different ways that they do things. Some people like to hide in the background. You've got some girls who are very shy and sometimes you just have to try and bring out the best in them. So I find when I give them responsibilities within their capabilities and let them chip at it, then they realize, oh, hello, but I can actually do this and I can do it really well. Um, it's as just say, everybody, I believe as well that everybody can be a leader. 
you know, even the less experienced player, there's something that they will be good at and that they can bring, whether it's to the court or even off the court. Because netball isn't just an on-court thing. It's the things that go on in the background of court as well. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I want to call you the Colonel because I just think that sounds really cool. So I may call you the Colonel for a while. <laughs> and I always feel, I mean, obviously with the, with the army and, you know, any military personnel, we do get that perception that, well, you do as you're told, you follow rank. And yeah. I mean, I've been in netball teams where you do have the mouthy one and, you know, they might disagree with the coach or, you know. <laughs> yeah. 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 I can't ever imagine that sort of being the case with army netball because of course what you all do i would just assume everybody follows suits and you do as you're told by your coach or your, your captain well the problem, um, is, the problem is with the army and i know it, it, it's not a problem but um the army really builds self-belief and confidence and and right from the the senior private on the on the vehicle park who's told right you're the senior private you're in charge of all the other privates you know, we are developing leadership right from the lowest level, um, you know, and, and so the, the, the players that come along, the, the girls that come along, yes, some of them will be shy when there's senior ranking people around, but they've, they've all had this, they've all been pushed to be leaders. And so actually, even though they are used to being told what to do, quite often, one of the problems is too many leaders. And, and that's why you do have to have a strong captain who is able to, to not, not sort of dampen that enthusiasm, but, but to be able to <laughs> channel it and manage. to use it and manage it properly. But, but yeah, I mean, that, that's why we are really lucky is we do generally have a fit cohort of, of girls who are enthusiastic. And of course, you know, they're, they're doing this in work time. So what's better, being on the vehicle park being in the office or being on netball court, you know, they're all enthusiastic and they're, they're all really keen to be there. And so even if they, even if there is a little bit of, you know, friction, it will soon settle down because they are all fighting for the same common goal. Yeah. Yeah. Do you Absolutely. find, I think with, with netball, especially at a young age, getting those school girls and boys to play, it gives them that role of leadership and it may give them that voice, Jess, that can help them in later life with whatever career they may go into. And, and that's actually something that definitely should be harnessed within playing netball, mm -hmm. especially at the grassroots level. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I think you can look across, as I say, lots of different sectors, but sport being just a real flagship for developing some of these characteristics which are kind of life that they're all encompassing aren't they in terms of life skills moving forward so um, it's interesting isn't it the topic at the moment and I know there's loads of news on social media this morning and canvassing for obviously there being a bit more support for PE in schools and in particular during this period of lockdown as well um, so uh, yeah absolutely giving everybody a voice is really important and I think <clears throat> on my coaching journey which I'll be on forever um, constantly kind of reflecting and evaluating whether or not I'm my practices are enabling people to have that voice is really important because there's one thing for it, it's great to have these plans in place and say that you want you know you want and and have a leaderful team but actually it's the structures behind that that are most probably really important which are kind of lifelong or you know if I was to move on from a role that that I've left a bit of a, a footprint there in terms of the leadership structure so constantly kind of looking back and saying does my coach <laughs> reflect the very things that I want to help develop in terms of leadership is really is really important um, and I think you're right like for I think it's great to hear Andrea talk about the structures within the army and how I guess um, instilled it's part of the DNA in the army that you're expected to take on responsibility from the get-go um, and I think it's really important as coaches and across our sport that we check check and challenge are we doing that and to what extent are we doing it and where might the opportunities be where we could do it better um, because I think with the best intentions and I talked about kind of the nurturer style of leadership before that can very the risk in that is that you fall into wanting to do everything for everyone and I've certainly made those mistakes before where I almost want it for people more than they do um, based on what you're seeing in terms of behaviors and actions so I think there is always kind of this if you dial up a certain characteristic in me, the chances are I'll end up kind of wanting it so much for somebody that I start doing too much. 
And, and that for me then almost moves in the opposite direction to what I consider to be really great leadership, which is where you're creating autonomous leaders, decision makers, independent thinkers, that ultimately the whole point of that for me is so that in those crux moments, you know, those 10 seconds that we're building up to for what might be on the biggest stage, um, that those character <clears throat> traits become come alive on the court and in our in how we perform so yeah I, th I, th I think it's really lovely to hear kind of some of the, the the bits where we align but also some of the practices and structures that I think the army most probably have got systematically because it's just part of the DNA and how we can learn from that in terms yeah. of sport is really helpful. Mm. I'm interested as well in the situations that you've obviously been in within the army I know Nordia when you were serving in Iraq am I right in saying your camp was bombed yes it was yeah <laughs> yeah I mean now I'm not going to directly link that to perhaps maybe being three goals down with two minutes to go <laughs> but in, in absolutely that, not no <laughs> in that split second when it comes to leadership either from somebody else or what you have inside yourself what happens in your brain how do you react to that well um the first thing I wanted to do was protect myself and protect the person that was immediately next to me because of where we were and what was happening at the time. Taking that situation, you can't really take that situation to the netball court, but in my head, the first thing is protecting myself and those around me. But you kind of almost have to protect yourself first before you can protect others. Because if you're going to protect somebody and you don't, for example, have your body armor on or your helmet, then you're no good to somebody else. So the first thought is protecting yourself. Well, I mean, I can never imagine it. I mean, Andrew, you, you've obviously served abroad yourself and you, you've been in situations that some of us will never even dream about, let alone be in. What do you think, was there a particular moment for you and... I know you maybe think I don't want to, you know, to be modest here, but when really you as a leader, it really shone because of decisions that you made that, you know, had a huge impact. Um, I think that's, it, that's quite a difficult thing because um, even though you're in charge of people, so in, you know, in Iraq, I was a squadron commander, so I had 160 um, soldiers under command. Um, and, you know, it's probably the little things, it's the little things, it's the welfare of the soldiers and it's, and it's your attitude and your approach because, you know, like every walk of life, you do get, you get the, the good leaders, you get the toxic leaders. Um, and so I think I, I, I wouldn't be able to pick out one big thing that I did with that was amazing. Um, because you're also part of a bigger leadership team. You know, you work for, at that point, I was working for the commanding officer who was then, you know, part of the bigger, the bigger, the bigger brigade. But I think, you know, to take on that, that nurturing part of leadership, it's, you know, you're, when, especially when you're on operations, the really key thing is, and it's a bit like net, my role as the chairman of Netball, it's, it's setting the right conditions, conditions and enabling the soldiers to do their job and the netball players to be able to do their job. And so I would say my, you know, my big strength is being quite personable and being able to be approachable and, and being able to hopefully find a solution to most things that sometimes some soldiers can't find a way out of and can't see a way forward. And so when you're on tour, it can get, it can get very lonely and very isolated. And it's just making sure that, you know, they're, they're having contact with their families and their loved ones and, and you know, that they're not having this horrendous time. Mm. You mentioned their leadership team. Jess, I think that's actually a really good point in the grand schemes of netball and your job in the Roses. How vital is the fact that you are part of a leadership team? Yeah, I mean, the way that you lead... Um, will hopefully kind of translate into all of those that, that you're working alongside, whether that's your staff members, whether that's the organisation um, or directly the player group, which is often what we kind of get drawn to when we're talking about leadership. So I, I absolutely, again, as I said before, I, I take joy out of kind of hopefully, as Andrea said, set conditions which enable people to be the best they can be, both in terms of their performance, but also their leadership and character traits. 
but also I love seeing that in terms of like the direct staff that I work with and also trying to have um, an impact, however big or small on the organization as well and how the organization is seen and respected and, um, and considered by not just other sports, but just globally within our own sport, but also across the sporting network and then across the landscape. So having that leadership team is really important and understanding um, each other and making sure you know the people is really important because you have to invest some time in that. Um, I just think one of the things that I wrote down where if we were going to get asked around like what do I consider to be important traits of a leader is you have to be great at reading people really great at reading people and that takes time as well and you have to actually invest in that and it's often something I talk about with the players as well you know like because turning up in a, a session a couple of times or you know for what will be quite small periods of the year in all honesty even as a national side our time together is far less than our time apart so actually how you're going to invest in getting to know the people that you're operating with is absolutely critical um because before you know that you can't really then anticipate how you're all going to respond in, in those pressure moments and you kind of want to fast track and accelerate that as best you can by the environment that you're creating so and we operate you know in terms of um, strictly speaking, we operate, I've operated a leadership team when I've come into this role initially in terms of there's no kind of, yes, we had Nat as captain and Laura as vice captain for some of our recent competitions, but they sat as part of a, a leadership team of seven across the Roses program. Um, and, you know, we're welcoming back all sorts of senior players with, you know, lots of caps, lots of experience, been to several major championships. So our, our opportunity at the minute is we are pretty much arriving with a very leaderful team. So I'll most probably be calling these two up about how to manage uh, <laughs> a, team, a team full of captains, how to get the best out of them. But um, what yeah. a great and privileged position to be in. Like it's, it's exciting yeah. times in terms of the Roses group. Yeah. Yes, I'll have you at a Roses camp before you know it. I guarantee you. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll talk about traits near the end. But I, I didn't want to make this a, to a battle of the sexes, if I'm totally honest. But I do think that in, in terms of leaders and leaderships, almost now more than ever, we're seeing so much on TV which represents leaders, whether that be in sport or politics, or we, we won't make this political. But do you think, and Andrew, we'll start with you, do you think that there is a big difference between how men approach leadership and, and how women do? Um... I, I do, I do, um, and obviously it's a sliding spectrum. There are, you know, there's there's males and females at, at both ends of that spectrum. But interestingly enough, um, it was a couple of years ago when I was um, working for one of the generals, and they were they were looking for the non-executive directors for the for the army board, and um, it's it was an, I, I found it an interesting fact that of the top the best performing top FTSE 100 companies had a female non-executive director or member of their board. And so I don't think, I don't think, you know, males and females are, are any better or any worse, but I just think it, it's a very different, we, we bring different qualities that, that hopefully will complement. And so I think if you, if you don't have a male on your board or you don't have a female on your leadership team or whatever, I think you're missing, you're missing vital key skills, you know, and when we're, you know, 50 50 percent thereabouts of, of the uh, the population it makes sense to have that mix that diverse mix um but i mean generally i think most of the the female leaders that i know are are more towards the nurturing side um but as i say i i don't think there's a huge i don't think there's anything that's bad or anything that's good i think just we we approach things differently and and whether that's due to you know that you, you can't get away from the fact that um you know male and female are physiologically very different and men generally are a, a little bit stronger and so maybe that translates into their their manner and how they how they approach things and maybe i think females will will approach things you know round the side and do and see think how they can do things just a little bit differently Nordia? Um, yes, I think there's a difference, um, but there shouldn't be because irregardless of what sex you are, there is, everybody can do like a particular job. So like in my line of work, whether it's a man or a woman doing my job, they both will do it 
you know, the same. There's nothing in that job that I would say a woman would do it better or a man would do it better. Um, I find that sometimes um, a woman as a leader may have more empathy compared to a man. And perhaps it's may, it could be because um, it's a woman's nature to be, you know, a little bit nicer. Or maybe sometimes men who are macho do not want to be seen as a little bit softer. So they kind of leave it to the woman's side. So, yeah, I do think there, um, there's a difference, but there shouldn't be because women can work as well as men, but having a mixture. So even in a netball team, of course, it, we don't have um, males playing um, army netball at the moment, but when we, we've had sessions where we've had strength and conditioning, and rather than use a female to do it, we've used a male because, you know, it's incorporating a male in our mix. We've got um, one of the guys who, she's female, she's deploying, so she's not going to be around next season. And we've got um, a man who will be taking over manager, hopefully. So it's gone where the days when we were like, okay, everything has to be female, being done at Army Netball. No, it, we've recognized that both sex can carry out the same thing just as, just as well mm. and can that all be taken to the netball court jess because of course i mean you know we've got a great presence of men's netball and mixed netball in this country yeah. and elsewhere now and and do you think actually the makeup of, of teams will change and vary because of that because there are ultimately different leadership styles yeah, i mean one of my early coaching roles when i um, right at the start of my coaching journey, I was really fortunate enough to work alongside Mike Greenwood, who was from Olden Netball Club. He's an absolute star um, and sadly passed away many years ago now. And I'm so grateful that I got to work as, it, as his assistant so early in my coaching journey. So I actually think in, in our sport, we have had some fantastic role models in terms of yeah. whether that's been in coaching, managing, as you say, strength and conditioning. We have had those male figures and certainly today, you know, we've got others across our, our league. Dan Ryan, obviously taking Northern Ireland yeah. and uh, Leeds Rhinos. We've got some great examples. Gary Burgess from an umpiring point of view. Yeah. Who that I've named him. So that's going to get me brownie points. But I think, <laughs> yeah, I, think, I think there has always been a presence. And yes, it's been a far less percentage than women because it has born out of a female dominated sport and I think that is something that we can and should be really proud of as well because we're seeing the emergence and I guess um, you know the growth of female sports that are kind of the jewel to their male counterpart in terms of rugby and football and one of the things that I think does act as quite a strength for us is that we are a female flagship sport that doesn't hasn't and doesn't yet have the equivalent in terms of the male side and I don't think we should ever see that as a weakness either but yeah. absolutely do I think things will evolve and change definitely you know you saw the Silver Ferns play against the men's team prior to their World Cup preparations I've absolutely welcomed the men into our camps over the last six months um, but also in terms of when you talk about staffing it's certainly something over the last 10 years or more that when I've been um, fortunate enough to kind of um, evolve a staff group together I actively seek out a mixed staffing group I, I, I think it's really important as Andrea said to have those different character traits my team manager now he'll love the fact I'm naming him as well um, Paul Dring you know like he's worked with the squad now over a, a number of years and, and went to the Commonwealth Games with that group and he brings a completely different outlook on everything which I think is really healthy and actually quite sobering because there's pros and cons as we know to the the female psyche as much as the male psyche so I think the fusion of the two is is often where you can get um a, a real benefit so yeah I would actively go about trying to have that diverse group amongst the staff yeah. we ran out of time hence why we've all changed with on the gallery view uh, but we are back and just a few more questions oh I mean, this is so interesting and I know that being all netballers you've been in difficult situations with your jobs but actually on the netball court and Nordia will start with you what would you <laughs> have been, and I know I'm slightly putting you on the spot here one of the most difficult situations that you've been in on a netball court or most challenging that you do remember? The most challenging was, um, it was actually recent. It was last year when I was playing and coaching and I had to let one of the girls know that I was going to put her in the second team, not the first squad. Um, I found it challenging because it was somebody who was my friend and I had to recognize that 
it's about it's a team effort it has nothing to do with that the person is your friend we have to achieve one goal and we're here to win and i mean colonel zanchez core team is a team that we're always fighting hard against and no way i was going to lose that court that game but anyway i'm um, having to tell her that we were going to put her in the second team i found it difficult because she was my friend so i thought about it first made sure i was making the absolute right decision um run it by two of the other girls two of the other girls with experience um just to see you know what their thoughts were and the, the reason i felt because there was another player who brought more who would have um even though she was coming off maternity leave, she was um, she was on the you know on the ball, ready to go, and had so much more um, interceptions and court awareness. So I spoke to her about it, and it was actually okay. You know, she respected the fact that I came to her and I explained that my um, the reason I made that decision. But yeah, I did find it difficult because I don't like saying to people, um, you know you're not good enough, I'm going to put you elsewhere sort of thing, or your experience isn't what we want at the moment. But as you say, if yeah. you want to win, that's kind of yeah. what you do sometimes, isn't it? Andrea, what yeah. about you? So, um, I think playing-wise, and Nordia will laugh because we discussed this the other day, I think the worst, the worst person or the worst team that I ever play against is the, the RAF. And of course, the RAF team that we used to play against when we were, you know, young officers 20 odd years ago is now the same team that we play against as masters. And there's this one girl that I play against and she's just horrible. It's horrible to play against her, but because I'm a shooter, um, it's something that for me has come with age and maturity is my self-belief on the netball court. So I was never really that talented uh, younger. I'm not saying that I'm hugely talented now, but... I, I now have a mentality on the netball court that I'm not going to let anyone push me around. And um, being six foot tall, you would have thought I've, I've always had that. But actually, it's something that has come with age and confidence. Um, and so now, even though I know it's going to be a horrible match, I sort of relish the challenge and I relish going, going into it. Um, so, yeah, that's probably playing the RAF. It's always emotional. <laughs> at six foot <laughs> I know I wouldn't want to mess with you. <laughs> Jess, what about you? Most, most challenging time you, you've had on a, on a court? Are all, are all yet to come, I think. <laughs> 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 um, no, it, uh, most challenging, but they'll be the most rewarding as well. So I have a yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I've, well, I can give one as a player, if you like, and one, an, an example of one as a coach. One as a player, I think, was um, it was actually a Netball Europe competition, going back to these guys, in terms of the reigning champions from 2019 in the Isle of Man. Oh, yeah. I feel like we're in good company. But yeah, I, they selected quite a mixed... I, I've got a feeling it might have been a Netball Europe Open, but it was one of the first times it was hosted by Malta. Um, so it was really interesting because we played in a, a strange facility and it was tiled flooring and all, all sorts of stuff. So quite... A different environment and they kind of mixed together some what I would call kind of senior players with some of the younger ones of which I was most probably a younger one at the time so we played with the likes of Karen Atkinson as an example most probably as a, a more senior figure and we, we traveled over to Netball Europe and I was unlikely to get lots of court time but absolutely loving the fact that I'd been given such a great opportunity to play with some other bigger stars at the time and towards the end, of, we were playing Wales. So England, Wales in any Netball Europe is historically, like certainly influenced yeah. how I feel about Wales <laughs> I'm growing up. So there's this real, yeah, real competitive nature in me. I've got a lot of friends who have played for Wales, so it's all good. But um, I think it was goal for goal in this game. And um, England had sent what was in comparison, a younger, less experienced team. So there's always that pressure as an England team that you should never really lose a Netball Europe, but actually it's like, how much risk do you take with the team that you send? So we hadn't really had any preparation with each other. We were relying solely on the fact that hopefully our younger talented players were still good enough to compete. And it was goal for goal and I was a sub at the time. And two of our players in the centre third, I think it was our wing defence and the goal attack. Um, I think we, we weren't in possession of the ball and they both went to try and win the ball and actually collided heads, um, oh God. both on our team. And one of the girls split her head open from like forehead right down. And like, it was, it was horrific. You know, there was, um, yeah, there was blood everywhere. Sorry for the members listening. It's a bit gory. <laughs> um, there was blood everywhere. Um, 
and I just remember, you know, that moment where it's like everyone warm up, but it was like, it felt pretty catastrophic at the time because we're in a foreign country. We weren't most probably that clear as to what the um, medical provision was going to look and feel like. And it was a serious injury. And I had to take the bib of the goal attack position in a gate, like, and the context being that we're like one down, I think, with like, who knows, 10 minutes left on the clock. Um, a team I'd never really played with, young, uh, just witness something that's terrible and everyone around is a bit shell shocked. Yeah. Um, and I just remember like, um, it was just a really important moment for me to always reflect on as to how I responded in that, because in terms of how that translated into how I played, I, I most probably avoided taking on like the shots or going into areas of threat. I was quite passive in that moment. So under that pressure, just there and then, it was a real eye opener is that yes, the context was very severe, but in terms of how that made me feel and how that meant I played, I just remember there being a moment going, I need to step up, you know, I can't hide in this moment. I've actually got to front up and take on some responsibility here yeah. and contribute to the team. And I think we did end up either drawing but winning the overall competition I think was the was the outcome based on points or goal average but it was just it was a really important moment for me as a younger player yes that the the accident obviously compounded that feeling but actually what it is to feel quite passive in withdrawal from the challenge versus actually stepping up and and fronting up on behalf of a team and it wasn't good enough to just kind of sit back um, and I did, I, I definitely worked my way out of that. But I think late in later years in like major competitions like Commonwealth Games, like it was something I could really hold on to in terms of how do I now work on that? Because if where I want to go is to play for England in big competitions, I've got to make sure that I can actually, it was a real like, lightning bolt yeah. moment, really. A bit um, of self-resilience. Self yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think that mental toughness and just being able to operate in, under those conditions you know everyone was a bit shell-shocked but it was I was really aware of how it impacted how I played in those few minutes uh, and then mm. a coach a coaching one I think um, I don't know if this really answers the question but I think in our world youth campaign um, where Anna Stembridge and I took a group to the Cook Islands in 2009 um, it was a really talented group <clears throat> but the coach that had been kind of leading them left with about nine months to go before the competition and Anna and I had been working with the player group so we had good knowledge of them and we kind of stepped up and were selected as co-coaches for that period and you know you're talking about Joe Hart and Ebony Beckford Chambers, Stacey Francis, Serena Guthrie, Sasha Corbin who sadly got injured just before the competition it was a you know everyone knows them now as household names but these are kind of rookies going for their first shot at winning a, a decent competition and we, we had a lot of work to do on the psychology of the group because at that point, yes. knowing the team had really won anything other than a bronze at a senior level. And Anna and I, with that player group, felt like we'd gone on a real journey. Like there was a moment in time where I think those characters, and they've gone on to prove that as well, they, they're a different, they were a different level in terms of their belief. And yet it was based on very little that had gone before them. And we really tried hard to harness that and we actually did go to um, Jamaica prior to the World Youth Cup and managed to get a win or two over there which really helped with the confidence but yeah in that competition <laughs> it was both sad and um, both sad but also really I don't know a, a real stepping stone because you could sense that we still came forth to Jamaica <laughs> in in that third fourth <laughs> day off um, and it was really painful, you know, like because there was a genuine belief in this group that they could actually achieve something that no real England team had done before. And the margins were still really small. Um, but in that third, fourth playoff, I just remember it being um, really sad that in those dying minutes, we could see. <laughs> You're going to have to cut that out, Tim, because Gorgeous just told no. me that he wants me. <laughs> yeah, in those dying moments where you kind of you know, you've got a few cards left to play, you know, as it changes, how can we impact on this game to claw back what was only really a deficit of a couple of goals? You know, we had the towering Romelda Aitken with Ebony doing a really good job against her. <laughs> we had to think about whether that. changes were needed. Um, <clears throat> so it's, it's a bit more of a global one because it was the, the whole competition. And I think it will, it, it will never kind of leave me as to how gutted, like, it was just palpable, you know, like there was no, I talk about authentic leadership as well. There was no hiding it from any of us. There was, 
we were just absolutely gutted and yet at the same time so proud because we knew we'd gone there with a belief that I don't think teams had had before but it just wasn't going to yeah. happen then it was most probably going to happen at, and as we kind of know how it's played out now for a lot of them it's happened in the in the decade after it but um yeah. we were just so gutted and I just remember you know Joe Harton is so competitive and I but I kind of felt like you have to fail to win and whilst yes. it wasn't yeah. what we wanted or what we tried our best to prepare for I felt I did feel an inner confidence that I knew those those athletes had it in them to go on to achieve it in the future and it's just making sure that we could capture that amongst the huge disappointment that we felt in that world youth cup so much had been achieved really um beyond whether or not we meddled there and then um so yeah sorry it's a bit of a, a bigger picture one but yeah. probably just a nice story really coming back into this role now and and seeing what they've been able to achieve in the last three or four years jess you mentioned yeah. earlier on actually i think it's a really good point fronting up there comes a moment where if you are captain, vice captain, whatever it is, there comes a moment when you're probably having a dreadful game yourself. How do you, Nordia, if you aren't having it, <laughs> how, do, how do you go through that knowing you actually still have to lead? Oh, you never have a bad game, do you, Nordia? <laughs> <laughs> I can't say that. Um, yeah, you can. I've had... I've had I've had off days and um, the thing is, being at the back in goalkeeper, goal defense, they, a lot of the girls, they look to me to, you know, keep encouraging, keep motivated because I love motivating people. So they look to me to motivate and I wouldn't say having a bad game. I would say, for example, if I was having a bad day, um, what I was going to say just is back to your point, just a little bit where you said about, um, the way you felt. I find that sports psychology has come a long way and has helped us massively. Um, we had sports psychology last season at Army Netball and that has taught us to cope. So going back to having a bad game on court, it's just um, thinking about what the end goal is and being there for the team. It is tough to do, but once you've got the right coping strategy, then you know you can achieve it. Um, yeah. I've never really taken myself off court. I think, to be honest, if I was having a bad game, I'd probably maybe be calling time and, you know, taking a breath and taking myself off, which isn't necessarily what the coach would want me to do. So I just have to front up and get on with it and sort it out myself and make sure that I am there for my team. There's got to be some perks to being captain, surely. <laughs> I mean, Andrea, you're, you said you're a shooter. You're a shooter. I mean, shooter to shooter, if the shots aren't going in, I am one moody cow on court. Oh, I've never yes. been. But I mean, you know, you miss that shot and you're missing a fair few afterwards, but yet you, you've still got to front up. How do you do it? So I think, and as I say, I, I talk about, you know, when I first used to play with the Army squad, you know, it, 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 for me, it's that self belief, knowing that you can do it. And again, this is something that the army, as I've said before, the, with, along with the leadership, they instill it in you, in the, in the most junior soldiers, that you can achieve. If you put your mind to something and you believe in it enough, you can achieve. And I mean, I've got a, a sort of an alternate um, army story. Is, um, I used to do paragliding and I was paragliding in France and we launched when we shouldn't have launched. Uh, it was raining and I really thought I was going to die. I really thought I was going to die because my canopy was getting wet and I was too high up. And it was in that moment, and that's probably been one of my defining moments when I looked around and realized the only person that could help me was myself. And that I had to absolutely be in control of that situation, get myself down onto the ground and get, get myself safe. And, and I think it's, it's that kind of mentality. So that was, you know, with the, with the army, uh, you know, ventures training. But it's what I find now that is very different to my more junior game is, and again, I don't know if it's just because I'm an old grumpy lady these days, but I'm not just, I'm just not going to let people push me around. And if I get one bad shot, I know that I can get the next one in. And so I think for me, it's that, it's that self-reliance and that self-belief 
then actually, you know, you can do it and you can you can contribute to your team being better than the opposition. Yeah. Thought it out on court, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Well, we're going to end on traits, so I'm going to put you on the spot. I know Jess already mentioned one earlier on, but to our members watching, if you were to pick out, say, three traits that a leadership, a leader, I was going to say should carry, but traits that, you know, you would like to see in a leader, yeah. what would you say? Nordia? Um, for, for me, I'd like to see um, effective and honest communication, not just communication. It has to be effective and it has to be honest. Because if you're not honest with each other, then there's a breakdown of communication. Um, motivating, a, a motivator. And I'm going to put two together, motivating and have integrity. You know, and lastly, respect for others, not just your teammate, but respecting yourself and respecting other people. So... You go to a netball game, it's respecting the other team, the coaches, the bench officials, the umpires, you know, the, 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 the spectators, respect for others. Those are, yeah, my three yeah. traits. Andrea? Um, I think you have to be authentic. So I think, so, you know, being authentic, believing, um, being, being the true you, I think it is, is really key for me. Um, having a passion, you know, having a passion for the task that you're trying to lead, um, and, and that belief that, that, you know, what you're doing is right. Um, and again, you know, that, that ability to listen, you know, it, as Nordy said, that communication, you've got to be able to listen. And, you know, if someone's got a better idea, because you're not always going to be right, you know, you're there to, to filter out what's right and what's wrong. And, you know, hopefully nine times out of ten, you've got, you've got the fair idea. But sometimes, you know, someone, mm. whoever it is, the most junior person might have a better ideas. So being able to listen, definitely. Yes. Yeah, I agree. Be, be authentic. Um, be inspirational. So just mm -hmm. inspire others, mobilise them towards that common goal. Um, and I think most probably picking up on the people reader. Just invest in your people. Um, know yourself, but make sure you know everyone around you as well mm -hmm. as you can as well. Um, mm -hmm. And that was a challenge for me, Claire, just to say three. I'm just going to put that out there. So, <laughs> That's why I put two of mine together. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Blag, that's another one. No, honestly, <laughs> that has been absolutely fantastic. Honestly, thank you so, so much for joining us for another thank you. Uh, Friday. Jess Selby, Vitality Roses head coach. Thank you, as always, our guests. Colonel Andrea Zanke, Chair of Army Netball, and of course, Nordia Masters, Sergeant, I call you Sarge. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's been great to speak to you. All the best going forward. Yeah, thanks. Thank guys. you very much. much. All the best.